so and I would like to welcome you all um, today. This is the first talk of the series called Inferentialism on Naturalist Grounds. It is uh, organized by the Language Mind Society Center at the University of Hrabat Kralove. And the series accompanies a forthcoming issue of philosophical topics. Um, in chat, you can find a link to our web page, to the web page of the Alma Center. I will um, update their information about particular talks. And also you can find there a link to uh, philosophical topics where uh, the issue should appear in uh, in spring, at some point in, in this spring. Uh, the issue in philosophical topics will include 12 papers and seven of those papers will be presented here as, um, as you know, online talks. Um, if you want pre-published versions of the paper, please let me know and I can send you those um, right after we finish the talk. Um, so our first speaker is um, Yarda Peregrin and Yarda will um, start with the talk aptly called Inferentialism Naturalized. Yarda, you can start. Okay, so let me put up my slides. I hope you see them. Yes, I can see them. Okay, so uh, the project uh, which uh, uh, gave rise to the special uh, issue of philosophical topic, which in turn gave rise to this series of lecture, is devoted to the investigations of possible way, possible ways to cross over uh, to uh, interesting trend in recent philosophy. Uh, inferentialism and naturalism. And my talk today uh, will look at one of such ways, one of such possible ways to merge these two, uh, these, these two trends. So, um, oh no, sorry. So I guess, uh, Everybody here knows uh, what inferentialism is. Uh, inferentialism was uh, introduced uh, in uh, Bob Brandom's Opus Magnum, making it explicit in 1994. Uh, it, intellectual sources are the philosopher of the philosophy of the later Wittgenstein. Uh, with his uh, theory of plentitude of language games, and especially the idea that the language games are more or less rule governed. This is not something with, which Wittgenstein would spell out in so many words, um, but uh, the space he devotes to rule following. Uh, in his philosophical investigations, uh, makes it plain that uh, uh, rules are somehow crucial for, for, for our language games. The, another source of inspiration, of course, is uh, Brandom's mentor, Wilfried Sars, who stressed that the rule crucial for our language games are the inferential ones. Uh, Brandom, in uh, contrast to Wittgenstein, and uh, at least partly in accordance with Sars, argues that uh, our linguistic activities are not simply a motley of language games. Uh, uh, he argues that language has, its, has a center or, or a downtown, as he articulates it, alluding to Wittgenstein comparison of language with an ancient city. So according in him, to him, it has a downtown, and the downtown is the game of uh, giving and asking for reasons, or, or uh, uh, go guard. Um, uh, Brandom uh, further stresses that the normative 
uh, it's not reducible to the nature of uh, there is a certain kind of ambiguity in in, in sellers teaching because uh, sellers on the one hand is a, a self avowed die hard naturalist on the other hand uh, he grants uh, normativity a certain amount of autonomy so this has led to the well known split between his followers the uh, left-wing Silarsians like Brandom or, or John McDowell uh, uh, stress the autonomy of the of the normative, while the right-wing Silarsians like like Ruth Milliken and J. J. Rosenberg and ours uh, stress Silarsian scientism and his naturalism. So Brandom uh, find this import find it important to. Uh, uh, stress that the normative is not reducible reducible uh, to the nature of it follows oh sorry it follows that brandomian inferentialism uh, is an improbable alley of naturalism uh, despite this i'm convinced that brandom theory of language harbors insights that can inspire a naturalistic theory of meaning and and of language. So I will try uh, to uh, indicate how we can reach a naturalistic version of Brandomian inferentialism, because it seems to me that if this is possible, then the result might be truly important. Now, let me say a few words about the question why we do, do not follow right, the right-wing Salarsians who go for a naturalistic version of his teaching right off. Uh, why this detour via Brandom, this seemingly unnecessary uh, detour? So the, the answer is that the detour via Brandom's work equips us with some ideas and concepts then can lead us to a truly viable naturalistic theory of meaning. So why is that? So I think that the most uh, uh, relevant right-wing Salarsian here is Ruth Millikan with her idea of teleosemantics. By the way, Ulf Lobel, who is part of our project, uh, investigates the naturalism of rules and of inferential rules via the Millikanian line. So that's the alternative route from, from uh, my one. Um, what is teleosemantics? Well, uh, we can say that an organism, its part or its property has something which can be called P function or proper function or I don't know what P function. And the p-function is thanks to what this item survived. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Unfortunately, this is this is normal. Uh, my cough, more even if I don't have COVID. Uh, so, so the p-function is of an item is. Thanks to what the item survived throughout natural selection, what the item was selected for. So the notorious example is that the P function of the heart is pumping blood with a certain amount, certain amount of uh, oversimplification. Now, what is important is that P function is already a normative notion. The point is that an item with this function can malfunction, and if it malfunctions, it's an error. If the heart doesn't pump blood, it's an error. Um, evolution institutes these kinds of functions by producing purposes. Of course, they are not purposes in the fully-fledged teleological sense, uh, from the view of teleology, 
they are merely pseudo purposes. But these are the only purposes which uh, naturalism uh, can help us to. Uh, so uh, these purposes institute a function, the P functions, uh, which which lead uh, to the to the normativity. So we can say that the heart should pump blood. There is already a normativity present. Now, what I want to stress is that there is a discontinuity to which Millikan pays less attention than it would deserve. And the, the discontinuity consists in the fact that we humans were endowed by evolution with such a flexibility of behavior that most of what we do is not directly determined by our purposes and our, and our functions. So the, the point is that we have acquired the freedom to do things that are not directly traceable back to, back to our evolutionary history. It's not, again, it need not be freedom in a metaphysical sense of escaping the uh, causal determinism. It's a freedom of the sense of acquiring uh, such a wide variety of uh, a possible behavior uh, that we can behave in a very opportunistic manner. So the fact uh, that I am now drinking coffee is not directly traceable to the evolutionary, evolutionary origins of, of mankind. So what this history has led us to is our freedom and our ability to act in a relatively arbitrary ways. So if you, if you uh, take such claim like the hair should pump blood, so this is something normative or something uh, for which the evolution might be seen as di directly uh, responsible. Uh, we can also say perhaps that we should have hearts pumping blood. Uh, and perhaps we could also say some, something like we should wash our hands before eating. This is also something uh, the rationally uh, of which we clearly, we clearly see. And we can say that not only we should wash our hands before eating, but it's also good to have a rule uh, uh, telling us that we should wash our hands before eating. So maybe if we have such a rule, then still evolution can be said to be directly directly uh, responsible for it. Now consider a very different uh, kind of rule, a rule of English uh, concerning the sentence, this is a dirndl. If somebody doesn't know what a dirndl is, it's a kind of a women dress traditionally in certain parts of Germany, it's, it's on the pitch. So we have the rule, this is a dirndl, should be used only when pointing at the dirndl. This is a very different kind of rule because here it doesn't seem we can say that it was forced on us by evolution. Uh, because there doesn't seem to be any evolutionary gain, any enhancement of fitness uh, coming from using this very kind of sound in this way. And maybe there is not even uh, any kind of enhancement of fitness uh, from having any kind of sound with this function. So the normativity of such rules can be called social or conventional. And this is as I see it, the normativity crucial for inferentialism. It is the normativity that is due to rules that at least partly result from our arbitrariness. So a rule, a rule like D is merely our human invention. And moreover, it does not seem to really force anyone to do anything. It 
has been adopted by our ancestors without being direct, directly selected for. It makes sense only together with our rules, with our rules of, of English. In contrast to this age, that is the rule about heart, is absolute independent of what we humans think and do. This may, this might lead us to the conclusion that it is age that is a real rule, while D is only some our parochial makeshift attempt at a rule. But we can see the situation also, also conversely. Remember that age faced the same as, as age prime. The heart was selected for pumping blood. Now it follows that age, that is the claim that the heart should pump blood, is just a paraphrase of an ordinary non-normative declarative sentence. And as such, it doesn't seem to be a candidate, candidate for a prototypic uh, rule. And uh, it seems to me that Millikan and Millikanian semantics sees the normativity of social rules as an overly straightforward continuation of the functional biological normativity. Uh, here is a quote from Millikan. If the human has been designed by natural selection, Assuming the human capacity to make plans, to form and to carry out intentions is well designed and adaptive, then this capacity must itself have been a product of natural selection. So whatever a human purposefully designs must be a product of natural selection as well. Well, there is a sense in which this is true, of course. But it uh, seems to me it uh, kind of obscures the situation is there is a certain kind of, of discontinuity. Here's a quote from a book by, Ma, by Martin Kusch, who characterized uh, the situation as follow, follows. It even seems to follow that only evolutionary biologists can ultimately tell us what we mean by our words. After all, according to Millikan's proposal, what we mean by our words is ultimately derived from our unexpressed bi biological purposes. And these purposes are studied and investigated by evolutionary biologists. Um, in my words, I would say that a rule like D is a product of evolution, okay, but only at a remove. Uh, evolution endowed us with our ability to set up rules and we have to use this ability to set up D. So it seems to me that it is, the, it is the ability to create, maintain, and follow social rules, which characterizes us humans as the special kind of animals that we are. Uh, and it seems to me that this is this sort of rules that must be considered when we want to understand Celarsi's notorious pronouncement that we humans are creatures not of habits but of rules. Well, by the way, this is a pronouncement of uh, early Celars, and I'm not sure whether this does not mean that I defend the early Celars against his, his older self, but this is just, just by the way. So, it seems to me that it is worth following Brandon because this obliges us to pay due attention to the social kind of normativity that is most crucially characteristic of us humans. Um, so that much for that much uh, for tail semantics. Now let me turn to the concept which uh, for me is crucial for the naturalization of uh, normativity and which is heavily used by Brandon. That's the concept of normative attitudes. Both Wittgenstein and Sellars insist that rules uh, cannot be generally identified with sentences of propositions. Well, Wittgenstein 
sees that uh, if we have something like a sentence, to use it as a rule, we need to interpret it. And we need to interpret it not just arbitrarily, by correct, but correctly. That means to use some rules uh, for its interpretation. So to have an explicit rule, we already need some rules. So not all rules can be can be implicit in pain of a vicious circle. Uh, Sirs uh, insists that uh, rules are primarily uh, primarily not written in pen and ink, but rather in nerve and sinew. Uh, so, so there must be something like like implicit implicit rules. Uh, Brandom introduces the uh, concept normative attitudes. That is not his invention. Uh, as far as I was able to find out, this uh, term is used, for example, uh, by the uh, famous uh, philosopher of law, H.L.A. Hart. Uh, but Brandom appropriates it to his purposes. According to him, normative attitudes are dispositions to sanction positively and negatively. And as rules to turn out to be in its most rudimentary form, uh, uh, something like clusters of propositional attitudes, now it seems that we have the reduction of the normative to the non-normative, that we have the reduction of rules to normative attitudes and normative attitudes to disposition. But Brandom disagrees. Brandom, insists that a rule is made up not just by normative attitudes, but by correct normative attitudes. Um, and what makes normative attitudes correct? Well, nothing else that our normative attitudes we assume to them. But again, not any normative attitudes, but correct normative attitudes, and so on and so forth. So this prevents us uh, from uh, uh, using this way to reduce the normative to the non-normative. As Brandom says, defining normative attitudes in terms of dispositions to apply sanctions does not by itself reduce the normative to the non-normative. It just trades off one sort of norm for another. And we will see that, that I disagree. So, Brandom sees the realm of the normative as, in a sense, self-encapsulated, not reducible uh, to the realm of the nature. But here is it that I disagree. It seems to me that evolution equipped us with the ability to assume normative attitudes and thereby to establish rules because this feat turned out to be useful for us. Now, might me useful, not correct, because um, evolution, it seems to me, institute things which, that are useful because they are, because they are useful. Um, the very concept of correctness, and now I mean the kind of social or conventional correctness which I find important for inferentialism. So this concept entered the world only at some later point via this very ability of us humans. So I would say that not evolution made us accept D because this was correct, correct, but rather evolution equipped us with the ability to create correctnesses and we use it to establish to establish D. So it seems to me that there are ultimate normative attitudes which institute correctness or incorrectness, but are themselves neither correct nor incorrect. Take the example of the rules of logic. They allow us to argue reason and play the game of giving and asking of reasons. Um, 
by establishing the arena in which we in which we can do so. And uh, in terms of the game, we can show what is correct and what is not in a specific sense. But of course, we cannot show that the fundamental rules are either correct or incorrect. Uh, they are what constitute this kind of correctness. So uh, uh, they cannot be uh, considered themselves uh, correct uh, in this sense. Maybe they, they can be considered correct in some other sense. So there may be rules to measure the rules of logic. But it seems to me that at bottom there must be some rules which already are neither correct nor, nor incorrect by themselves. Now, the question is, how is it with rules with the causal, causal world? Uh, are they there? Are, are, they, are they diagnosed by scientists uh, which concentrate on the uh, uh, causal world on, or on the, as uh, Sellers would put it, scientific image? Well, yes, during the recent decades, there are a number of scientific studies, empirical studies, which talk about such things as, as uh, normative attitudes. I have two quotes only here. Uh, one is from a paper by Kelly and Davis uh, from uh, uh, Social Philosophy and Policy. They don't use the term normative attitudes, but um, they are talking about the very same phenomenon, obviously. So, from a psychological point of view, a distinctive defining feature of norms concerns approval and disapproval, and the use of punishment and the rewards to influence behavior. In short, norms imply odds, and odds imply punishment and reward. Uh, the, our quote is from a paper, uh, from a recent paper by Schmidt and Rakotsi who study human, human early ontogeny. And the quote reads as follows. Taking to that together, the research reviewed suggests that young children develop normative attitudes towards a variety of different acts in different contexts. They enforce social norms as unaffected third parties, suggesting that they take an impersonal perspective regarding norms and understand something about the normative force and generality of norms. Importantly, from early on, they enforce norms in context relative ways and take into account different social pragmatic cues when deciding whether our actions fall under normative assessment or not. So this is just to document very briefly that normative attitudes are something which is recently studied by, by empirical, empirical scientists. Now, uh, let me turn my attention to the uh, rules of language, to the relevant rules of language with two uh, inferential, inferential rules. Uh, Brandom says, the idea is to understand propositional contents as what can both serve and stand in need of reasons, where the notion of a reason is understood in terms of inference. So uh, propositions, as well as other kinds of meanings, are uh, creatures of inference. This is the basic thesis of, of inferentialism. It's not, not really surprising. But it means that if we manage to naturalize inferential rules, we have also a naturalization of meanings. If we inferentialists are correct, that meanings are inferential rules. Now, one of the possible ways to, to test the viability of uh, uh, my the theory is to check if it can explain how meanings could have come into being. I mean, if it can, if a naturalistic story uh, explaining this. Uh, uh, hence, a viable naturalistic theory of rules and meanings should be able to explain how people feasibly came to follow rules 
and how they feasibly came to produce meaningful utterances. I just want to say that this is not supposed to be an infamous just so story. I'm not going to tell you what happened in our prehistory without being able to give, give of course, to give any, any evidence. I want only to give an indication that such a non-circular story can exist. So I don't mean to say that uh, what I'm going to present is uh, uh, through description, description of something. So let me, uh, let me turn to a proposal of Dave Bicecker, which he presented in two papers uh, approximately uh, 10 years ago. Uh, what he presented is uh, a detailed model of how normative attitude could have appeared and could have led to rudimentary rules of language. Uh, so imagine our prelinguistic and prenormative predecessors uh, uh, trying to cope with their environment. Uh, they try to exploit the behavior of their pairs for their own benefit as they try to ex uh, explore, exploit anything else in their environment. And imagine that they register that certain, as Dysacker puts it, grants or hoods of the pairs could be associated with certain circumstances. Um, so we may see it so that associating a certain kind of hood with an approaching tiger is of the same kind as associating clouds with an approaching rainstorm. So it's some step in the uh, inductive building of theories or proto-theories of the world, which we could think our pre prehistoric predecessors uh, uh, would be engaged in. Uh, so, so there is the association of clothes with rainstorm, association with a certain kind of this tiger, but there is a difference. Uh, the expectations which we uh, would have on the basis of our previous uh, previous experience uh, could be frustrated uh, if the expectation that clouds will bring rainstorm uh, gets frustrated then the only sound reaction is to modify the expectation, to modify it so that not the clouds not always bring rainstorms. Only sometimes, only some kinds of clouds and so on and so on. We can do the same if the hood, if we see a tiger and doesn't hear our pairs emitting the expected hood, we can, uh, uh, modify our expectation and say, well, well, not always they, not almost always emit the hoods when they see the tiger. But we can do also a different thing. We can try to make them emit the hoods. <laughs> so while in the case of the clouds and rainstorm, the only sound reaction is the modification of the expectations to fit reality in the case of the uh, hoods and the tiger, uh, we can also try, try to modify reality to fit, fit the expectations. We may try to force these who display the hoods to modify, the, to modify their behavior. Uh, that means to emit their hoods so that the expectations will not get frustrated. So we have these two possibilities. Uh, which of them shall we choose? Well, it's not quite clear uh, which is the better option. So it might turn out that what we do is to uh, go with our pairs. To, to, that means uh, uh, we might take into account not only Shivu hoods, but also the reactions received uh, from uh, from his other pairs. So if most of the pairs try to make the individual change their hoods, 
one joins them. If not, he modifies his expectations. So, so one tries to go with the majority, either to modify the expectation to fit the reality or the other way around according to the ten tendency of, of his pairs. Now, uh, by, by consulting the behavior of others, I may gain a feeling for which this place should be encouraged and which should be suppressed and which are correct and incorrect res uh, respectively. Let me make a little digression. Simon Blackburn, in his 1984 book, Spreading the World, considers a theory of the birth of the normative out of the non-normative that he aptly calls democratic harmony. It consists of the claim that to be correct is to be in tune with the others. So to do, uh, to do things which also others do. And this, this theory is certainly not acceptable, acceptably general. It's highly implausible in, in general because, of course, if we all believe that the earth of flat it, it, that the earth is flat, it uh, doesn't mean that it is correct to believe so. But it seems to me that it might be possible as an account of the birth of the most rudimentary kind of normative. The most rudimentary normative attitudes may have to do with cutting outliers down to size. So, uh, back. So it seems to me that this, uh, I mean, um, starting to assume the normative attitude to ours uh, might be seen as truly birth of the most rudimentary, rudimentary form of normative. Now, let me say a few words about what, what I call the game of indication and which it seems to me might be interposed between the situation I was just talking about and the game of giving and asking for reasons. So, what may happen, as I try to explain, is um, that a sound habitually emitted in a certain situation may be tied to the situation by means of normative attitude. That is, that is uh, members of my tribe might turn out to emit a kind of hood when they feel danger. And because this is useful, for example, as a warning, uh, we may tend to make each other to display, display this kind of hood just in case there is anger. We might try to evince something which evolves into normative, normative attitudes. So suppose that the hood accompanying danger sounds just like the current English word. So, uh, we, by assuming the normative attitudes, we institute the rule, one should emit danger always and only when there is a danger. Now, imagine there is a different sound, which is to signal, or which is, uh, which is accompanying not danger, but the absence of danger. Let us suppose that it sounds just like the current English word calm. But uh, we probably should not say that one should emit calm always and only when there is no danger. Uh, I think only one half of this rule is possible for a sound like calm. So it's so that one should emit calm only when there is no danger, not, not always in such a, such a case. So uh, there is a general, general rule generalizing on two. The rule of the shape, one should emit A only in circumstances C. And I propose that it's only rules of this kind that uh, establish what, what I want to call the game of indication. So there are so, some this, that indicate various kinds of, of circumstances. Then there might be a different kind of rule. 
the second half of the rule of rule one, that is one should emit a, a always in circumstances C, but I don't include this into the game of indication. This might be a rule of some further game, the game of warning, which can be uh, played at top of the game of indication. But uh, let me put this aside for the time being. Uh, now, we should, we should see that the circumstances that determine the propriety of emitting certain sounds might become constituted not only by extralinguistic situations, like an approaching tiger, but also, for example, by sounds, by other moves of the game. Now, it may happen that if there is a sound A indicating the circumstances C and the sound B indicating the center circumstances C prime, such that C and C prime cannot occur simultaneously, that's like a danger and calm. We have, when it is correct to emit A, it is not correct to emit B. Uh, if, on the other hand, C prime is bound to occur whenever C does, like the situation when there is a rabbit nearby and the situation when there is an animal nearby, we have the rule, when it is correct to emit A, it is correct to emit B. Now, a rule of the form 5 renders the sound B incompatible with A, while 6 renders B inferable from A. So, there might start to appear an inferential relationship with, between the sounds, sounds constituting our uh, proto-language. Uh, now, this relationship, as I presented up to now, wholly derived from possible or, or necessary or impossible concomitants of events in the world. But uh, I think that the ensuing structure might not keep merely mirroring the facts concerning the necessary or impossible concomitants of events in the world. Once we embed it into the language, it acquires a life of its own and start to regulate rather than mirror our future experience. That means that if we have the rules that uh, danger is inferable from tiger, then if we encounter some animals which are similar to tigers, uh, but are not dangerous, we cannot call them tigers, unless, of course, we modify our language. But modification of the language is, uh, uh, is uh, always a complicated, a complicated matter. So in this, in this moment, the rules of language start to be underpinned by an arbitrariness that impedes their construal as direct products of evolution. I was talking about it at the beginning. Of course, this is not to say that we have managed to extricate ourselves from the accountability uh, to evolution. But we have extricated ourselves from being too closely monitored by it. We have a limited possibility to go the way we choose. Though possibly in the long run, it may turn out to go against evolution. Is with it, in which case it will get hampered. All else, else which it might turn out to accord, accord with evolution. Now we have the game of indication, the inferential structure of, of language, the rudimentary inferential structure of language, which, which appears there. And we may continue to get to the game of giving on and asking for reasons to go back. Because we may consider rules of the following kind. For example, if somebody emits an incorrect indication of the present situation, you should emit a correct one. Or if you emit a correct indication of the present situation and somebody reacts with an incorrect one, you should emit another correct indication from which the original is inferable. Um, we can imagine that such rules may serve, uh, uh, for, for example, uh, to 
indicate more ac accurately, which might be certainly certainly helpful. So now, now imagine uh, that we uh, may play a very rudimentary, but still game of giving and asking of ranger. So X emits danger. Uh, epsilon disagrees. He doesn't see anything dangerous. So following the rule seven, she uh, emits calm, which counts as a challenge to access uh, to access danger. But X following the rule eight emits uh, as it were more specific indication of the situation, maybe accompanying by a pointing gesture, tiger. So this is the most rudimentary, it seems to me, a game of giving and asking of reasons for the first move amounts to axis uh, indication of a danger. Um, uh, epsilon as a response to this indication indicates something that is incompatible with axis indication, namely the absence of danger. And X has learned to react to an indication incompatible with her own indication, and she would put forward a more specific indication of the situation she indicates. So it seems to me the, in this way we may we may imagine how rudimentary Gogar arouse out of G, GI. Um, at this phase, still the rudimentary form of Gogar can still have only one kind of multipurpose move, which can be called a, a proto-assertion. Uh, the thing is that this playing one of the available sounds might count as a challenge uh, a proto-assertion might count as a challenge, a request for reasons if it is incompatible with a previous display, or as a support, a presentation of reason if a previous display is inferable for. Uh, it means uh, that um, it means that we can make do still uh, with uh, one kind of move because of the uh inferential structure of the language because of the incompatibility relation uh an assertion might count as a challenge because of the inferential structure uh an assertion might count as as giving reasons now we can imagine that the further development will be that the set of sentences will grow a bigger and more differentiated we may have the difference between indicative, imperative, uh, uh, inquisitive sentences and whatnot. Also, let me know in pass, note in passing, we can expect the emergence of logical words, uh, which, which might be introduced by mean of such rules like, it is correct to emit A and B, if it is correct to emit both A and B, or it is correct to emit if A then B, if B is inferable from A. Uh, this construal of the function of logical words leads to a uh, so-called expressivistic understanding. Uh, this is the understanding of logical words as expedients of uh, making rules explicit. Or once we have the logical word, uh, we can not only follow or, as, it, as the case might be, violate rules, but we can also articulate articulate rules and to a certain extent uh, uh, bring, bring them it inside uh, of the game of giving and asking uh, for reasons. Uh, now let me consider one more view of the uh, stuff uh, I was presenting so far. So the environment of an individual of a social species, like us humans, is also constituted by its own specifics. So it is necessary to react to them and to what they do. 
and also here it is vital to react appropriately as it is vital to uh, react to the outside world to recognize what is to be eaten and, and, and what is a predator from which we must escape and so on. Now the environment of us humans is constituted increasingly more also by the sounds our conspecifics emit and we learn to react to them. It is important to realize that though now we play Gogar in a very advanced mode, we challenge an opponent's move because we do not believe her or because we want to know why she asserts what she asserts. And we give reasons because we want to convince our opponents and because we want to explain to them why we assert what we assert. So that's the, that's the contemporary advanced mode. Uh, uh, it was not so at the beginning. So the Gogar is based on inferences. We must not imagine that from the outset, it was inferences as we make them today. Inferences by which we draw a meaningful conclusion from meaningful premises. The proto-inferences, uh, uh, which start to establish Gogar, uh, grew out of something more like conditional reflexes. We learn to react to various sounds with various other sounds. And as this game grew more complex, the roles of the individual sounds grew ever more intricate till they become what we now call meanings. So the picture is that meanings and gogar bootstrap themselves into existence, mutually propping each other up. And I would want to say the way not able to elaborate on which on this very much. This bootstrapping, I think, can also be considered as a case of, of what has come to be called in biology niche construction. So the construction of the environment of a species, of the biological species. So conclusion. Let me give, let me summarize what I have said in a few points. So first, rules, and now I mean the social rules, which I consider important, can be considered and as consisting of normative attitudes, where the normative attitudes are ultimately natural behavior patterns. Um, inferential rules, may have originated from the normative attitudes that fix our usage of particular, particular sounds. This process is continuous with what we know from the animal realm as niche construction. The specific kind of niche that is in play here is the niche constituted by our sounds. In this way, they may, may appear some rudimentary rule governed practices featuring displays of sounds that may further give nature rise to the game of giving and asking for reasons as we know it today. By becoming vehicles of the game of giving and asking for reasons, birds acquire inferential roles which constitute their rudimentary meanings. As language grows more complex, the inferential roles mutate into what we now see as their meaning. So that's it. Thanks, Yanda, for the talk. Um, I open discussion. If someone has a question, then please use the uh, raise hand button. So Preston is first. Okay, so Yarda, I, I want to ask you about the extent to which you see this as defending the early sellers against the late sellers. <laughs> with with that that claim about um, humans being creatures of rules and not habits, and I, I want to ask you about that with mm -hmm. regard to Brandon's view that. 
uh, normative attitudes as meaning constituting aren't just the attitudes we happen to have, but the attitudes we ought to have. Yeah. But I, I want to ask you about those two things with specific emphasis on a claim you made in your in your in the slide right before this, where you said that um, normative attitudes could be understand as understood as ultimately natural behavioral mm -hmm. patterns, because that sounds like something that goes against that younger sellers in the sense that it sounds like you're appealing to a notion of habit there. And it also uh -huh. sounds like the kind of thing that isn't going to be compatible, at least with one reading of random understanding normative attitudes is what's proper and not just what we happen to do. Okay, so first, uh, uh, in the issue of philosophical topics we are putting together, there is a paper by, by Anki, Anki Bruinig about SARS, and she stresses that, especially uh, for the later sellers, the border between physics and biology might be more important than the border between humans and other kinds of, of animals. So it seems to me that maybe, maybe he would be more sympathetic with the uh, Millikanian line, line than with the, with the uh, Brandomian one. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that uh, the important thing is that uh, normativity uh, arises in the in the biological world. So, but it seems to me that uh, what is what is crucial is our human kind of normativity. Because if you want to say that a man is distinguished uh, by being a creature of rules, then it seems to be it cannot be rules which apply to our animals as well. So it seems to me that it must be the uh, uh, social or conventional rules uh, which, which are uh, our, our achievements, to, uh, at least to a great extent. Uh, so, so this was the source of my remark that maybe, maybe I am defending the younger sellers against the older ones. But, but this is not to be taken too seriously. I, I don't know as much about sellers as, as I should, should know uh, on this. Now, the second thing is that um, I urge the um, uh, naturalization of normative attitudes and thereby the, the naturalization of normativity well, I don't know. I don't know. It seems to me that there is a sense in which uh, sellers would agree, and this seems to me to the basis to the to be the basis for the right wing uh, Sarsians like like Ruth Millikans. It seems to me that in a sense his realm, his, his scientific image is self encapsulated, and certainly there is uh, something like normative attitudes there as uh, behavior patterns, and so on and so on. But uh, that there is also the manifest image, and I tend to see the manifest image as uh, uh, something which opens us uh, new vistas on things via our concept and our normative machinery. But uh, it doesn't seem to me it allows us to see something within the scientific image, what is there. And scientists don't see it, see it there. So now I don't know whether, whether it was at least partly intelligible what I said. Yeah, no, no, that, that helps. Then let me just ask a, a quick follow up then with regard to this, because I think I, I now see how to place it in terms of the Sellers and, and Millikan line. But then what about this Brandomian claim that what's important for meeting is not just normative attitudes that we happen to have, but the ones we ought to have? It, how is that going to stand? The, when considered against your claim that normative attitudes are ultimately natural behavioral patterns? Well, I, I, I simply disagree with, with both. Okay. It seems to me that, of course, uh, there might be attitude, attitudes which we can sort into correct and incorrect by other kinds of attitudes, but in, it seems to me that somewhere at bottom, 
there must be attitudes which themselves are not either correct and incorrect, only institute correctness, but are not themselves liable to assessment as correct or incorrect. Okay, thank you. Pavel, you can go. Your microphone, your microphone. Yeah. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. It's turned on. Uh, so thank you for your talk. Well, my question is kind of similar to the presence one, um, but maybe from a different perspective. Just uh, what is there uh, that Brandon would disagree with? Uh, to put it very uh, simply, Brandon certainly would not want to say that his inferentialism somehow uh, goes against, uh, let's say, evolution theory. Of course not, he would be, uh, that would be ridiculous. But, but he claims that the specific human normativity that we know is not in some sense reducible to natural facts. And you seem to me to, in a way, say the same thing, don't you? When you say that, it's, well, it's not as simple as, as Millikan uh, claims and I don't see where the difference with Brandon is maybe. Okay, okay. Uh, I should stress that where I do agree with Brandon is that, for example, normative claims are not translatable, translatable into non-normative non -normative ones. When you say clink is wrong, it's not a paraphrase of an indicative or declarative, declarative sentence. I agree with, with, with Bob in this, but it seems to me that it is just because normatives form uh, slightly different kinds of speech acts, just like uh, questions or, or orders are not uh, uh, translatable without, remem remember, without reminder into indicatives and or uh, declaratives. And so, so here, here, I disagree, here I agree with Brendan. Where I disagree is that the realm of the normative is self-encapsulated in the sense uh, that uh, uh, you can never uh, uh, explicate the notion of correctness or explain in a in a non normative in a non normative way, and it seems to me uh, that um, uh, as I as I try to indicate, uh, that the normative attitudes are not. Uh, correct or incorrect, uh, uh, so to say, ad infinitum, that at some point you must reach the ground uh, uh, where it's, where it's uh, no longer anything normative. That's the, that's the Wittgensteinian problem with reaching the rock bottom of, of, of our language. So it seems to me you reach, at some point you are bound to reach the norma normative rock bottom and uh, you can say what it is uh, to be correct. Okay, th thank you. Uh, is it okay? Oh, I see there's an example. Okay. Then Wojtek. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, of course. Okay, yeah, because I, I'm 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 not seeing myself in uh, in the video, so I wasn't sure. So, so my question is, um, let me let me let me push a little bit more on the on the transition from the from the uh, game of indication to Gogar. It seems to me, as in the very broad pictures, you are saying that from the indication to games of giving and asking reasons, it seems to be like this broad step is based on reducing the noise. So you are saying that, okay, you may indicate that there is a danger of the predator, or you may indicate that there is a food source in the distance, but what would be the evolutionary pressure to give more precise signals? It seems to me it is costly, it is time consuming, and you also, you put yourself into a more dangerous situation by sending more signals and indicating it's danger, it's tiger. You are making yourself, um, exposed to the danger of the predator you may it, it may notice you or secondly if there is a food source you might be better off to get there first 
So it's better to indicate, okay, there is a food source, we, we should go there, but I might be better off to be the first person to get there. And it seems to me that this step from game of indication to Gogar, there must be some evolutionary pressure to reduce the noise, either for a group or for the individual. And uh, I was just wondering what you, you might say about this. What okay, okay, okay. So there is a trade-off between signals uh, which are uh, quick but unexact and those which are slow and and exact or more more exact it seems to me and uh, you are certainly right that in many situations the quick and unexact are better than those that are that are slow slow but exact but it seems to me that there are many situations in which it is the the other way around that sometimes we uh, re might really not need to know exactly what's going on uh, even if it uh, takes some time well uh, in a sense it's it's connected uh, it seems to me to be connected with the uh, well known distinction well known distinction between our cognition of system 1 and system 2 maybe uh, maybe at first there was the the system 1 which was altogether slow and unexact and then because it uh, paid in some situation, we evolved the system two, which was slow but exact. So uh, sometimes it seems to me it uh, pays to have uh, it uh, pays to have a system which is maybe slow, but which is which is exact. If of course you are right at uh, some uh, specific uh, environmental pressures must. Uh, be must be involved yeah but uh, it doesn't seem to me too difficult to imagine something like that okay okay thank you Steffi can I ask uh, hello, thank you. Uh, I have a question which moves a bit into the same direction as, as the last one, a question of detail. There was one step I did not understand in your uh, game of indication, um, because you said that there are some something like proto rules, right? Uh, and the first proto rule was uh, call danger if and only if there is danger around, yeah, predator, yeah, yeah. for example. And then you said that we might introduce a second rule uh say call calm only uh if uh, yes. there's no danger around yes? yes and this was something like a proto relation of incompatibility so that's quite important that step yeah, right yeah. but i cannot see where the motivation is if you have say um a group of animals and you have uh this behavior according to rule one firmly established called danger if and only if there's danger, where's the motivation to have a second rule like calm, right? Because uh, like uh, if the behavior is firmly established, then you can count on the others in the group calling danger whenever there's danger. So why should there be a motivation to indicate calm if danger uh, is indicated every time uh, that there is danger? So, so uh, imagine we are a group of prehistoric hunters and in the evening we come to a little forest and want to want to relax, but are so tired that we are not able to really look look around. Only there is a young guy who is still full of energy, and he exclaims, "Calm!" And we are glad that we can lie on the ground and sleep. So this is this is this is of course an, an anecdote, but it seems to me that. Uh, uh, the game of indication is is based on the fact that it pays uh, to indicate all kinds of things around for various reasons just well yes um well, two, two points about random. Uh, well, first, maybe a question. So do you claim that um, rules are ultimately in some sense reducible to 
normative attitudes. It, it, it seems to me at one point. On the other hand, you claim that you oppose this idea of uh, democratic harmony by Blackburn. And if my, if I may, uh, uh, if I may uh, uh, give a little explication of mine, I think Brandon, you know, has a good insight that normative attitudes are quite essential for rules. Uh, you know, the, the rule isn't something that's valid somehow by itself. It's intertwined with our normative attitudes. On the other hand, it's not just fully reducible because of the phenomena that you spoke about, uh, namely that um, most of us or uh, everybody can be wrong in some situations, not only about whether the earth is uh, round or flat, but also about ethical questions, uh, aesthetic questions and so on. So that would be one question, I guess. That's, that's enough for the time and so, maybe one more. So, so, so first thing, uh, I think that rules are, in a sense, are reducible to normative attitudes. And as far as I can see, Brandom says the same. Uh, here, I, I, I think there is no discrepancy. The discrepancy is where you can naturalize the normative attitude. Second thing, that rules are based, to say that rules are based on, on normative attitudes, uh, is something very different from saying that uh, uh, the normative harmony theory holds. So, uh, 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 of course, that when you, for example, add, there are normative attitudes involved. When you uh, add wrongly, then your teachers and, and, and everybody will say that it, it is wrong and will want you to correct yourself. And there's no democratic harmony, harmony involved. Of course, that uh, everybody knows that uh, 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 one can make one can make mistakes. One can think that uh, a sum of two numbers is different from what it really is, and so on and so on. So it seems to me that there are two two different two different things. Okay, I see there are further questions. So I believe we should go ahead with other questions. Thank you. Okay, then Ronald can have a question, and if there will be, if there's time, then Pavel can um, can ask further questions. Ronald, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I also have a question related to the uh, democratic harmony, mm -hmm. um, and so in your genealogy, it, uh, this comes really early, right? The uh, I kind of the the urge that we have as social creatures to to harmonize mm -hmm. our expectations and our, mm -hmm. our behaviors bring them in line and i'd be curious um how you see that in relation to what uh, you price calls the norm of truth in fully up and running uh, uh, uh assertional practices right so so uh he says that uh if i assert p and you say no, that there's a, a norm, what he calls the norm of truth, that uh, prima facie obliges us to bring our attitudes into harmony. But uh, if I understand him, he thinks this norm gets introduced uh, among us through the development of the concept of truth itself. Yes. So it's, it's coming really late, right, uh, in, in his story. So my question is, do you, do you side with you price? You think the norm of truth does not reduce to this kind of urge to democratic harmony, or, or, or is it more of a reductive story? You think this, what he calls the norm of truth, is actually precisely one variation of that urge to democratic harmony that we have? Well, so uh, it seems to me that the, the democratic harmony could be used to explain the very origins of normativity, the most elementary form of normativity, which is still with us. For some cases, for example, uh, uh, whether uh, uh, the English, uh, it is correct to use the word dog for dogs, that is oversimplifying a little bit what the majority of English, English speakers does, or something, something like that. So it seems to me in this, in this case is true. But then, in many cases, uh, uh, 
uh, we shift the normative attitudes not to the result but to the process. So whether a particular animal uh, is a dog doesn't depend on a majority vote, but on a kind of a research. But of what a majority vote decides is what what is the correct way to research to research the animal to reach the to reach the result. It would seems to me now uh, now Hugh Price uh, Hugh Price's uh, uh, norm of truth. Uh, it seems to me has to do with our tendency to converge on a, on a common word. Yeah. So so so. There is there is something well it it already uh, it already had has uh, roots with what I was telling about the origins of Gogar. There is a rule: if somebody uses an incorrect indication, you are obliged to use the correct one. So so this is also it seems to me a rudimentary gesture towards the norms of truth. You cannot just accept what you. See as incorrect. So, 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 so this is what what I would say. I have a question by myself, so I'll use my authority and ask. And if there if there is no question, then Pavel can follow. Uh, I partially follow. Uh, my question is partially a follow-up to what Stefani asked, um, but I start with uh, making one distinction. When you talk about rules of language, then you seem, according to me, you seem to talk about two different things. Uh, one thing are rules such as danger or calm, that you should not, or you should uh, utter danger only in specific situations. And then when you talk about rules of language, then you talk about something like structural rules. Mm -hmm. And the most explicit form of these structural rules are uh, logical rules, but, and the most basic form of these structural rules are incompatibility and inferability. Um, when, you, when you started your talk, you, uh, you said that there, there must be rules which are not correct or incorrect, but which are useful. Um, yeah. I can imagine what's the usefulness of rules such as danger or calm. Uh, and you, I, I think I understand how we get from this stage of having this sort of useful rules to a stage in which we have social rules, mm -hmm. which are useful in some other mm -hmm. sense. Uh, but I do not understand what's the usefulness of the structural rules. What's the mm -hmm. useful and how we get how we get how we get to the rules of infer inferability and incompatibility? Okay, two 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 kinds of answers. A, a general one, a general one. It uh, as, what is important about rules such as rules as language that was like my dear the rule is that the rules are usually not useful by themselves. Well, the uh, rules for danger or, or, or calm were originally use, use, useful by themselves, but then later they were integrated in, into a language where rules kind, kind of support each other. And it's no longer the question whether a, a particular rule is itself, but whether the whole like the whole of language or something like that is is useful. So so that's the uh, that's the uh, general general answer. Uh, the specific answer for the story I gave is that uh, simply at first, for example, the incompatibility rule that calm is incompatible with, with danger simply derives from how the world works. There cannot be danger and absence of danger at the same time. So this is at first this is kind of a derivative rule. Simply, you you wouldn't wouldn't do both because it it it, it uh, makes no sense. But then again, you integrate the rules this rule into the language as as you call it a structural rule. Make it 
make it a structure. And then, then again, there is a component of language which kind of turns out to be useful for various purposes. Okay, thank you. Pavel, do you want to have a follow-up? We still have some time. Uh, okay, um, well, I'm not sure if it goes against what you said or if it's just a additional remark, but uh, we have this contrast, let's say, of uh, nature and of culture, which is somehow <laughs> can be perhaps seen as a complicated system of rules or system of systems of rules or whatever. Uh, and uh, um, Brendan um, says also, and he's by far not the only philosopher, of course, that not only that our uh, culture uh, uh, is related to our nature uh, and stems from it in some sense and evolved from it, but also that our nature is again imbued, is uh, determined by our uh, culture. Our culture changes our nature. Uh, you know, in his book, Reason in Philosophy, Brendan, you know, adduces examples that our habits of eating, of course, are uh, by far not just determined by biology, just sexuality, whatever. Everything is just full of uh, this, our uh, uh, rules, so to say. Um, so I don't know how, how, how if, if you would have some, um, I, I'm not sure if it's relevant, but if you would have some comment to this, if this may be kind of um, uh, relativiz relativizes the meaningfulness of naturalizing uh, inferentialism. Well, I'm not sure I, I understand. Uh, of course that, uh, of course that you have this, this nature and culture uh, the culture is a matter of what I in the talk call our freedom that we are kind of in contrast to our animals we are free uh, to act in many different ways and we are free to constitute something something as a culture and of course this uh, uh, has a um, Backwards influence on nature and so on. So, so, so I, I certainly agree with this. I, I'm not sure. Well, the, the, the question of naturalization is that uh, uh, Brandon, uh, Brandon thinks uh, once more that the, that the realm of uh, normative is completely self, self encapsulated. I think it's not completely self encapsulated. <laughs> So we have run out of time. I would like to thank Yarda for the talk and everyone else for attending and for the discussion. We'll see each other in two weeks. Uh, Ladislav Koren will present uh, his paper on confirmation bias. So uh, feel free to join us again. Thank you, Yarda, once more. Yeah, thank you.